want to give everybody a real quick walk around. Um, this is what he looks like in his current stance. Uh, there's the bumper I built, and I'll kind of explain more of this in the video, but this is kind of what you're seeing. Steer smart bracket in there, um, deviate beadlock wheels. Um, this is, I've got some shorts on this, but this is the JL fender chop that I do. It's very different than everybody else does. Because if you see, I leave this front part here because I still use that front stabilizer to maintain integrity on the fender. But that's my take on the JL chop. Uh, it fits my 39s, it fit the 40s just fine. But anyway, um, there's just a bunch of stuff. Uh, little homemade custom mounts for the ditch lights that, that caddy on to what I've already got built. And um, same thing with this fender chop on the rear. It's something that kind of how I do it versus how everybody does it. Peel on the outside lip and making it a little bit taller. I don't think it needs it, but nevertheless. Uh, and then the Baja rack that, that I built and specifically designed for the ability to add a riser so that I could still run a tonneau cover and still run my refrigerator in back. Now, I don't have it in here now, uh, but for the purpose of the video, when I do the back side of the walk around and kind of open it all up and show you guys, I'll put it in there so you guys can kind of see how it works. Uh, but that's him in a nutshell. I don't know what, what we're gonna do with the name, but we'll figure something out. Do me a favor, comment below. If you got an idea for the name, give me ideas. I'm definitely shooting down the trail wrecker. Uh, I don't like it, it doesn't stick with me, so we'll see where it goes. All right guys, here's the front. So the front is a bumper I made. I made it a lot of quarter. Um, the reason why I want this bumper uh, is because I couldn't find anything on the market that I liked completely. Uh, the closest I saw to it was probably the um, quarter pounder by Evo. Some of the gender right stuff is nice as well. I, I, I feel like there's a little bit extra going on and, and these already have cooling issues. So this is where I went. And so just as a little background, this is a 2021 Jeep Gladiator uh, Rubicon diesel. So, even that being said, there's, there's limited parts for it, specifically for it. Uh, moreover, most companies are making kind of a combination um, part that works for the JL and the JT. The problem with that is, is they generally work for the JL and JT if they're the gas. Generally, if they're a crossbreed, it, there's a bunch of things you need to manipulate when it comes to it being a diesel. That being said, I wanted to build something of my own. Uh, the tire's got to turn right now, but generally uh, it's closer into here. And so the reason why I built these extra lips, unlike the quarter pounder, is because this lip right here helps shed things right to the tire. And once it's the front of the tire, the tire either goes over it or sheds it out again. Uh, it's factory with the LED light group. I think that's super important because it's a huge upgrade expense. And if you're gonna do it anyway, why wouldn't you just start with a factory warranty and have them put them in the first place? The next big thing uh, that I searched everything for and, and was not gonna say no to was having a truck in. This is something that was a mandatory option. I do a lot of this stuff myself. I'm driving a lot by myself. I found myself in the last two years in a lot of predicaments where we're going over drop-offs. I can't tell if they go straight or left or right. And some of them have been severe enough that if you made the wrong turn a foot or, or one the other way, you would be in a very dire situation. So if you don't have one, look at one. If your friend's got a wheeler, go wheel it and use this thing going over real sharp cliffs and you'll be amazed. Because what I do is I still hang the arm outside. I get to watch my track where I'm going with the tire as I'm driving. And all I need to do is watch that edge. And when I watch that edge, I can easily look inside and see the screen and see what it's gonna do when I go over and which way it's gonna go when I do go over. So, just something I really um, appreciate. Moving on. Um, this is a Smithville X20, uh, 9,500 pound winch. Um, I do a two to one usually, which means I go to it the actual piece that I'm attaching to, back to a snatch block and then back to it and make it a two to one. So generally I'm pulled with 18,000 pounds of power. I've never found this thing to have an issue pulling anything, to be honest. Um, to rewind my ropes, generally what I do is I pull it all the way out and then I use the winch and I pull the winch in reverse uh, uh, or the fork, excuse me, and that's how I wind them. So, uh, 
I know there's a lot of talk out there about needing extra pulling power, but in the industry I do, I'm, I'm rigging certified for uh, elevating huge pieces of equipment up via crane uh, to either high buildings or, or, or cell phone towers. So it's just something that I suggest you do. There's no point in having a static pull with a single line if you can break it down and, and decrease the pressure, uh, first of all, on your winch, and then secondly, on the static load on the actual rope that you're pulling with. Now, most synthetic, we get it does drop, but there's still a lot of, we'll call it kinetic energy being placed on it while you're stretching it. And so, why not just take the time to add a, add a shackle into it and break it down one more time, make it that much easier? That's my thought. Anyway, moving on. Uh, these are the rigid uh, SAE fog lights. I replaced them and used them, and I used them on a JL platform as well because they spread, the beam pattern is far wider going up the sides, and it feels far more in the middle of the uh, vehicle being in this slimline form. So, that's why I chose these. These right here are the Casey Highlights uh, Pro 6 slimlines. I've got them in amber. I love them in amber. I wish I had honestly more amber. Uh, but at this point, they're, they're working really well. They're really, uh, a really good concentrated beam pattern. Even though they're, they're type on a spot, they, they have a little bit of, of more flood capability than you think. And, and so you add the ambers, and they do a really good job of directly in front of you, highlighting what you need to see in fog and, and, and rain and snow and stuff. Um, let's see, what, what else from that? Uh, you'll see a lot of gold bits underneath there. Um, I guess moving up top, uh, these are the two lights that I consider probably hands down against anybody some of the best driving combo high speed spots on the market and they're the Baja Designs SL80 Pros, XL80 Pros. Uh, they put out a ton of light. It diffuses really well and the spot side is incredibly strong. So those are something that I brought from the JL platform that I just didn't see anything on the, on the market that I thought was is uh, we'll say as good as they were light output reliability fit and function and for the price because I put these XL80s up against the LP9s and, and the bigger guys LP6s and the bigger guys in the market and you would you would be surprised how strong they are. Um, moving on, I, have, I just recently got the co-lights. I'm using them for ditch lights, they're in amber. So what they're doing is they're taking the outside amber edge from here, and they're kind of filling it in with ditch lights. Because again, remember, we have to remember that if you're, if you're in a situation where you're using your ambers, and the only ambers you have are facing straight forward, well, then that means you can't really see much out here because it's all dusty as well. So. Uh, I decided to go with the, the ditch lights and amber as well. That way, if I'm having to run ditch lights and it's dusty and foggy, I can at least see what's going on along with the ambers. The neat thing about those is they're a yellow amber. So even if it's not a dusty situation, they really do put in a lot of light. So you can see just as well um, if you're just running your whites and those. So that's that. Um, for wheels and tires, it's a DB8 bid lock at 17. Uh, and this is a 3917 BFG KM3. This is probably the 10th tire I've tested or so in the last year and a half. So that's what they're in their interface right now. Uh, I've got 2,000 miles on them. And I'll tell you right now, I, I read a bunch of mixed reviews and I honestly can tell you, I think they were unfair. And I think there's a lot of stuff that goes into, you know, misusing things improperly and, and you know, not not always having the right tire inflation pressure and, and not monitoring things like that, maybe not airing down the way you should. Um, and again, I do have to put a disclaimer, having bead locks allows me to go a lot lower uh, than the average person, which means I get to see the full benefit of the tire and, and what the manufacturer's doing with them versus the person that's running on, a, say, a factory wheel or non-internal bead lock or something like that. Um, and it's you know, maybe, airs down to like 15 or 16. I assure you 15 is not the same as 10 or eight. So when I've had them down that low, they've 
they've really, really worked. And so, right now, we'll see how longevity goes. I don't have any much chipping or anything like that yet. So, I'm, I'm super happy with them at this point. Uh, the price is on par with everything that's good in this, in, in this range. So, as far as mud, I've had them on some mud slick stuff so far. Uh, no rock yet, that's next. Uh, but if you go back and watch my video, the Rondo videos are, I was able to navigate that entire park. Uh, as heavy as this big girl is, or this big dude, um, in two wheel drive uh, with traction control off and, and just lowering the pressure to like 16 pounds. Uh, he was able to kind of track through that big, thick, heavy stuff mud with no problem. So that says something. Uh, next thing is going to be the lift. The lift is a three and a half inch game changer by Metal Cloak. I spent my time, you know, researching so many lifts, and a lot of things are very important to me. And the first thing is important to me is to convey to you guys, money wise, in my opinion, what's the best way to spend money because we know all this stuff is super expensive and bougie. And that's also why I build so much of the stuff I, you know, I buy. This bumper is made at all quarter. Uh, it's not going anywhere. I think altogether, it cost me under $200 to build. You can't find a decent bumper that rivals this bumper in build quality or material for less than 700. So that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. That's what I took into the lift. That's what I take into everything I do. And I know I'm kind of rambling and there's a lot to go over, but I want to get to this real quick. The reason why I went with this is because again, I was trying to get the best bang for the buck and several brands came up, came up, um, rock crawler, uh, Evo manufacturing, metal cloak, Terraflex. So there's a lot of brands that came up and the one thing I noticed that was different from all of them is that metal cloak, told you when you go to this three and a half inch game changer to get the full three and a half inch flex out of it, you required, required a front drive shaft. So I'll tell you this right now, none of the other ones did. Some of them makes note about you can get flex, uh, more flex if you use different shocks, but the current shocks that they're paired with, you do not have to replace your front drive shaft. Well, if that's the case, they were three, some of those were three and a half, some of those were four inch. If that's the case, if it's a four inch and it's a true three and a half inch that matches this, then why don't you have to replace it? Because I can assure you, with this, with the metal, with the metal cloak three and a half inch game changer on this trip, on this truck, uh, the drive shaft was touching at basically no flex at all. So if I wanted to get more than my two, two and a quarter inches out of it, I was gonna have to replace it. So obviously I got the drive shaft with it. Um, and there is a huge amount of clearance difference. And if you look at one of my shorts that I just put it out recently, I think uh, with 39s stuffed, I think I said 37 inches of flex that I got out of that front right tire or front left tire um, on a forklift. So I looked at it, did a forklift test and before uh, the back left came off just right at the edge, it was at 37 inches. So that's incredible out of a three and a half inch lift. And that's what I'm telling, telling you about as far as um, lift kit for the money. Everything's deep uh, plated, it's not gonna rust. It, ha it stands up really well. And so that was why I went with the three and a half inch game changer. If it's really a three and a half inch or four inch, there is no way you can get away, whether it be a JL or a JT, without replacing your front drive shaft. And if they're telling you you can, then they're not giving you the full three and a half inches or four inches of lift. Just keep that for food for thought. Moving on, uh, I have the Artec truss kit up here. I trust. I did the entire truss kit. I even front gusseted the knuckles. Everything's gusseted. Um, I also have R RCV uh, indestructible shafts uh, on it. The reason why I do that every time is because, A, the durability of the truss handles the warping and bending issues that they, people complain about the JL and JT having. That's handled. Now, now that it's truss, trust at the axle knuckles and then all the way across uh, the axle, I don't have to worry about that. Then, 
I go with the RCVs because again, the first thing you use to get up on something is your front tires. So the rear shafts are generally stronger by factory due to the fact that they're carrying the load when you're towing things. In any vehicle like this that's made to tow, the rear end axles are generally made out of something either bigger or stronger, and, and that's why. So if this is gonna be the first thing I'm using to pull these big 39s up, I kind of think they probably need to be a little stronger. So they got RCVs. Now, currently in the Jeep, I have 410s, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, probably when I do the 5,000 mile review on the Jeep. Um, we'll go over kind of what I plan to do with with the uh, gearing and why. As of right now, um, this dude with the 39s and all the weight on it, um, with the trailer, all the way to, to Arkansas and back, you know, we ran 75 miles an hour, generally in seventh gear, um, sometimes in C8. But that's impressive. There's a lot of weight that's been added. So it's got 14 gears in it, and I figure right now that's doing well. Uh, that's super strong fitting. Uh, so I went with the RCVs, and then later we'll kind of we'll go over on the 5,000 mile review. Like I said, we'll go over what I plan to do and why, what the reasons are. Um, oh, I guess we'll go over that. This is something that, that I've been asked a lot. And so these are standard uh, pod mounts. And then I build, this is a, uh, another bracket I've built. It's basically an L bracket that I made. This, this antenna is magnetic. Obviously these guys are aluminum, so you know, so, but this is an antenna that just magnetizes to the mount that I made and I screw it on the opposite side. These ditch lights are the same way. I just built a, a, a single L shaped bracket out of uh, eighth inch uh, diamond plate, painted it, and then that's what my ditch lights are on. So pretty simple. Anyway, that's it for the front. Okay, real quick, you can see this rear bump I built. I did the best I could to make it mold to the sides, but also give me the same protection we needed for these long bed sides. It's made out of six inch plate by quarter. It's super strong. I Frenched in the original uh, fog lights from the front and then used the original tow hook from the bumper to kind of maintain that look. By doing this bumper this way, I ended up uh, saving about six and a half inches or gaining six and a half inches of ground clearance from uh, the original tow uh, hitch point where it hung down and then and measuring from the ground to it. So I actually gained, like I said, six and a half inches for that departure angle. It's worked incredibly well. Uh, I've got some scrapes on it. I do run the bedside down on the back of it uh, and it's held up really well. But um, there's a lot of places that I think I'm gonna touch and I end up not because, because I was able to tuck it up so high. Um, moving forward, uh, this is why I went with a Gladiator because I no longer wanted to have to deal with um, going in and out of the back of the JL and having everything packed in it and not having the full capability of the interior. So I've got a on, on board all the time air compressor. I've got four totes right there or three totes. I can't see what's back there. That's four. Uh, and then my fridge is always in here. So when I get home, there's nothing I even have to unpack. It's literally just ready to go, but the entire inside of the vehicle is ready as well. So um, you can see it works well for my application. Um, there, there's the Baja rack that I call, uh, that I built because they didn't have something that worked for me. Meaning the all the racks that they had were, were actually mounted in this area right here. Well, if you mounted in this area right here, you couldn't carry a 39 or a 40 because obviously it would, it would run into the cab or you'd have to be above the cab. So this is the design I came up with. Therefore, I could run my side marker lights. So when we're doing trail running at night or trying to locate a camp at night, we can see. I run my ambers right there because they kind of bounce off of this instead of hitting the other driver behind me right in the eyes and it works really well. Those nylites lights are super cheap. I think I got both sets of those four inch for about $120 with wiring harness. They've lasted two and a half years. They still look really good. You can see the screens aren't bad um, and they do well. They do exactly what they need to be. Neither one of them needed to be super bright. They needed to be function, functionable for what I was using for and that's that. Um, this allows me to have the cover on the top. We did mess up and it is a little dirty back here. Um, in the Ozarks, 
we let the tonneau cover roll back. We were hauling wood and stuff, and, and it ended up raining that night and getting everything super dirty. Haven't cleaned it yet, but anyway, I regret uh, not closing it, but nevertheless. Uh, here's some, um, this is Built Right Industries Molly panel, and I've got my high lift there. Again, I am a proponent of a high lift. If you've been using one, I'm going on 30 plus years of using one. I've been using it for you know a long, long time on ranch work, and then of course just doing different things throughout my life. I don't find them to be super um, dangerous, but again, I've been taught how to use them, and I've been using them for a long, long time. Um, anyway, this is what I wanted to show you guys. I have the refrigerator in the back of the bed on a slide under a cover and not in the vehicle's cab. That's where everybody's still doing it. They're still doing it in the back seat. You're losing all that space. The whole purpose of having a truck is to gain space, not lose it. This is what I came up with. I couldn't get another 45 liter fridge that would fit in a 17 inch area. The sidewall of this bed from here to the top is 17 inches. There's no 45 liter fridge that's 17 inches. Anyway. Uh, four boxes that stay in here all the time, airs, tools, recovery, fluid, and then of course back there's my porter cable, $150 uh, on-demand air. It, it will outdo the dual compressor ARB that costs $700 all day long in its sleep. Um, uh, to run my Dominion 45 liter, um, it's plugged in here all the time. It's always, it's always hooked up. It's not even running right now, but I've got a 100 amp AGM battery, sorry. Uh, and then a control panel where I've got some light. And then I'm gonna add some interior lights to this bed area. You can see why it's so dark later on in the future. But I also have an Energizer 2000 watt inverter and that's what runs the uh, generator. And that is all controlled via an automatic switch under the dash. And so I can leave it on auto, and if that thing uh, loses a little pressure, it'll air itself up. That way I have all the way ready to go. It'll, it'll air up the four tires here and the two tires on the trailer in a little bit over 11 and a half minutes, close to 12 minutes from about 10 PSI to 35 PSI where I run it. That crushes anything else on the market, and again, I paid $150 for it. Um, it takes up a two by two square. So if you need space for it, just think about it. you're gonna need a two by two by two foot tall uh, area. I can afford to find that kind of space for a $150 compressor versus a $700 compressor. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Um, I've had that one for three years, it's 150 bucks. So if I had to buy several more, you know, what are you talking about? Another 11 or 12, 13 years of wheeling before the price is matched? I'm good with that. Uh, nevertheless, that's my setup. Um, and, and, and again, I was trying to make the, the best use of the space. And, and the biggest thing about having the Gladiator over the JL was I wanted to be able to um, be trail ready and be ready to go all the time. This gives me that option. And again, I get to keep my refrigerator with me. When are you at the camp when you're out wheeling? Never, obviously. So you want your drinks and your sandwiches and stuff in your refrigerator with you. Now I have that. And I can still have four passengers, five if I want to do. Um, so that's the benefit about having this versus a JL. Um, that's pretty much the setup and back. I'm going to do a little bit of adjusting here. And I haven't really decided how I want to do it yet. But this is my prototype stuff. And it's worked out really, really well. Um, I generally back up to the gallery area on my trailer and use uh, this entire bed area as a prep space, plus my refrigerator's right there. So it just makes sense, right? Or it makes sense for me. Um, because again, like I said, I'm trail ready all the time. If the guys just wanted to go on weekends, I don't have to do anything. They literally call and I say, okay, I'm ready to go. I've got my air stuff, I've got everything I need. I put drinks in there and I've got my sandwiches in there and I'm even ready to go. So. Just, just food for thought later on. That's why we do what we do. And then of course there's the Wii Boost and my shovel and axe stuff. Um, that's all pretty simple and understandable. Um, what else? That's about it. Uh, again, the reason why I did all this stuff is because they didn't have it on the market. I didn't want the bed open. I wanted it closed. Uh, and to do that and be able to fit the fridge in back and always have it, this is what I had to do to come up with it. The hinges are from Amazon. 
Uh, and all together, I think that slide was probably 150 bucks, 200 bucks. So again, save money where you can. I will tell you, I'm a huge proponent of lights and functioning lights and things that are important. Um, so you can see I'm running the co-lights, LEDs for my ditch lights. But when I have to see, look what we're running. I mean, you can't skimp on those. And they actually, they hands down light up the sky. They really do. And then of course for my ambers, you know, I've got those. So again, it's the theme about doing what you need to to make it functional, but picking the things to spend money on versus things not to spend money on. And so anyway, I hope you liked it. This is the back of it. And it simply closes like this. Close that down. And we're locked up and ready to go. Doesn't get water in there, doesn't get the snow in there. Um, it just does what it's supposed to do. And, and I'm super happy with it. Anyway, we'll go around and check out the inside. Or the inside. Let's see. We've got an Amazon switch bank uh, that I found after two vehicles. It works really well, it really does. Um, you can get it in a six switch or an eight switch. For what I've used it for and the abuse I've given it, it's, it's done really well. Um, over here, I have the bullet point mounting solution. Uh, the magna mount is for my phone. The center is for my iPad mini. And then the far right side is for comms. Uh, you can't see it right now, but right here, I run a Midland. And that's what goes out to that antenna just outside on that mount right there. And then other than that, I've got some of my badges right there. Then there's not too many other things that I've done to the inside. Uh, the one other noticeable thing is gonna be this guy. This guy is the Banks I-Dash. Uh, and I also have it coupled with the Pedal Commander. Um, and it's done wonders for the lag that these vehicles have. And it's for any vehicle, just so you know. So it, the I-Dash is not just for a diesel, uh, but it's for all types of vehicles. And it takes the lag out and the 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 response the slow response built into the programming that the dealerships give you because um, sometimes you just need to get out of your own way and and that's what it does um what else that's basically it that's really it for right now um standard leather rubicon trim uh, the back seats all the same obviously not much different. Uh, I've got my race radios right here. I always carry multiple types of radios. I've got GMRS right here um, in the Midland up there. And then I've got the race, rugged race radios right here. And I've got two just in case somebody's with me that doesn't have a radio or somebody's with me um, and we need to have a separate way of comms, whether we're, whether we're spotting or just trail riding. And then the one thing I do have that you guys haven't seen is this guy right here and that's going to be my fire extinguisher so it's a quick grab it's two um, belco releases and then you're in so that's pretty much it um, i haven't done much to the inside there's not much that it takes uh, i probably will consider one of the um, easy rider soft tops at some point but but not now um, it just suits my needs so well and, and it really has come come a long way. And, and I guess here's the back side of that mount that I was talking about. Um, and the Wii Boost antenna. Uh, again, that all that does is amplify signal that, it's, that it hears. It doesn't create it, it only amplifies what it hears. So, anyway, that's, uh, that's him. And uh, at this point right now, I'm super happy with him. I'm gonna jump out of this part of the video and I'll get back and I'll sit down and t talk about some of the subtle differences between the 3.6 and the 3.0, the diesel and the 3.0 and the 3.6 and the V6 uh, gasoline engine and um, where I kind of think Jeep should go via my opinion in the future. Um, at this point in the video, I kind of wanted to give my quick differences between the 3.0 and the 3.6 and, and what I believe. And again, guys, this is an opinion. Uh, I'm not a professional driver. 
I've just been driving a diesel for probably the last 18 years. I drive a Ford um, diesel for, for work and I have for, like I said, 18 years. Um, I've got a lot of intimate knowledge with diesels uh, versus gas. And I think that from the get-go, if you're making this your lifestyle, whether it's crawling or overlanding or a combination like me, a 50-50 guy, 50-50 uh, means you try to sort the um, most untraveled areas and routes to your destination to overland, that makes you 50-50. I'm trying to crawl in the process of getting to where I'm going and I'm trying to overland where not everybody else is overlanding. So um, that being said, the biggest thing, the biggest benefit that you can get from a power plant is gonna be low end torque for what we do. And so that's what diesels are made for. The, the whole purpose of a diesel is to move heavy capacity uh, items at lower stress on the motor. Well, what do you do when you take your Forerunner Tacoma, Jeep, Gladiator, JL, uh, JLU, JK, uh, whatever the platform is, what do you do? The first thing you do is add an immense amount of weight, skids, bumpers, lights, accessories, uh, goose gear platforms, refrigerators, drawer systems, roof racks, roof tents. And then you expect that the vehicle should be as good as it was prior. You're literally buying the wrong tool for the job. So I got to thinking about it and our fix at that time when I bought the JL is uh, the diesel hadn't been, been out yet. So our, our fix was thinking that the rip would secure that and fix it. It doesn't. It does if you don't tow. Um, I tow all the time. So when you come out of boost, you've got no low end torque. Now it's now the pro charger is non-beneficial because if you're not on boost, it's not producing any power. Well, the problem with the motor that you're starting with is it's under torqued anyway. So <clears throat> that being said, even the rip isn't, isn't a fix for what we do. If you're adding weight to your vehicle, the simple fact is a diesel is built for it. It's built to do what we do. We're behind the curve on this. In Europe and everywhere else, they've been using them for the last 35, 40 years. And petrol engines, gas engines are very hard to find. That's because they don't do the job quite as well as a diesel. Are there more costs to it? Sure. Oil changes are more costly. You have to change the fuel filters as well. That's more costly. The fuel is generally more costly. That being said, the wear and tear is far less on this motor than it is on its counterpart that's a gasoline motor. It does the work, the same amount of work, whether whatever you pick, a load to pull, a weight to carry, it does its job far easier and less strain on the motor. I believe they should yank the 3.6 period and just put in a 3.0 in all platforms. It's that much better. It's that much better ease of driving the way you feel driving it, the confidence you have, um, its ability to do the job that we're all requiring it to do. Um, we took a 1,150 uh, mile round trip from Amarillo to the Ozarks uh, for the rally a few weeks ago. And it was the Gladiator built like it is now with 39s and all the stuff on it. The trailer, myself, another person, we went, he and I both weigh over 200. Uh, all of our gear, food, water, uh, 15 gallons of water in the trailer. And we, we averaged 75 miles an hour and we were getting right at about 12.2 miles to the gallon in fuel. Um, there is not a um, Jeep on the planet in a 3.6 platform that could come anywhere close to that. Um, and so that's the stark differences. Is it, it's ge geared at 410, just so you know. Do I want to change that? Yes, because the only thing I don't have is my eighth gear. So that being said, that entire trip, I was in seventh gear doing 77, 75, 77. Most of the time, at no stress of the motor, 2000 RPMs. It was really just cruising. The only thing was, is it, it was gear hunting because I haven't changed those configurations yet. I don't have a taser menu in to do that, but, or a taser period, but I'll make those changes and then at the same time I want to give it a little bit back so when we when we do modifications to the vehicle so dramatic to all the tires and axles and again 
It's got an entire lift kit, it's got RCB axles, it's got a truss kit. It's, there's, there's a whole lot more weight added. So it's just the smart thing to do to change the gears. Do I really have to? If I wasn't pulling that trailer, I don't have to. It runs at 80 or 90 miles an hour with the 39s and all the weight in it right now in eighth gear all the time. But with the trailer, it's a little different. So I just wanna remove some of that stress. Again, in my opinion, you're trying to less stress what you're using. So um, Mike from Last Line of Defense is a huge proponent of always trying to save weight. And the reason being is because he, he loves his rig, but he understands that there's a certain amount of things you can do and things you can't do. And he understands that the performance of that vehicle is directly related to what he's putting on it. So be mindful of that and use it properly. And so again, I'll re-gear this. Will I go something crazy? I don't know. Um, I, I was probably thinking 48s or 513s. I'm not sure which one. I haven't really spent enough time looking at it. Uh, but I'll tell you this, in the JL, uh, with the RIP Pro Charger, we did uh, 456s, 488s, 513s, and none of them were really kind of what we needed. Uh, because again, when you come off boost, that thing wasn't producing any power. So it was really hard to nail down. With this guy, I could probably go to 456 and get my eighth gear back. Do I want a little bit more than that for towing that? Yes, that's why I'm considering the 488s or 513s. I'll cross that when it uh, happens. So just an overall driving experience. The 30 diesel destroys that Pentastar, hands down. So do me a favor. Take yourself to a dealership on a Saturday when you're bored and drive the JL and the Gladiator in both three sixes and then turn around and drive them in the diesel model in stock form and I promise you, you'll be blown away. I was and I would buy this thing 14 times over again. Everyone was asking, hey, what about the new Bronco? I was like, yeah, the new Bronco, great, put a diesel in it. Seriously, uh, I kind of played with that because I was really considering it. I talked to a really good guy at Ford and he said, you know what, for doing what you're doing, don't buy it. He said, that's not the motor you need. So again, buy what you need and buy, buy the right thing. And if you're not buying, make considerations moving forward. Try to go aluminum with things. Try to lighten up your gear and, and, and accessory stuff. Just think about what you're doing. Um, but with that, I, I will say hands down the diesel. I would buy it 14 times over again. So anyway, guys, uh, remember, go to my link tree on my Instagram. It shows you all of our different uh, websites. Uh, you can see the merchandise, you can see gear, you can get coffee cups, bags, shirts, all, all different kinds of things. Uh, also, um, remember to, to like this video and share it. Uh, that helps me out immensely. And please, I spend lots of time communicating back and forth with all you guys. Put all your comments below, ask the questions you wanna know because I don't want you to buy something if you're not really comfortable with it and, and if I can shed any light into that and it's always objective, uh, do it. And I'm always on your side, not the vendor side. I have 100% in your pocket and that's what I'm worried about, you spending money that you shouldn't have to. So if you have questions, ask. It does, They're never mundane, it doesn't matter what they are. Ask me, I would love to answer them if I can save you a buck. Anyway, Trip, Maximum Overland, you guys have a good day.